As I previously said, I've been on 250 milligrams of testosterone propionate per week, recently added 25 milligrams of proviron a day, and there has been fleeting use of quarter tabs of aromacin based on how I feel and trying to keep water down to an absolute minimum as my GI feels much better that way if I control estrogen a little. Again, as I previously said, when I was done with competing and pushing gear hard, there would be Primo runs, Primo Bowling, which I am defo happy to do based on this blood work. What's up guys, Derek from ReplacementAids.com. Today we're going to be reacting to Trained by JP, Jordan Peters blood work. He is uh, downsizing as we speak. And if you do not know, Jordan Peters, a very accomplished coach and uh, I don't know, guru in this industry, as well as a house of a fucking bodybuilder. The guy is like five foot six, 300 pounds, or at least he was until he, you know, decided to uh, pull back on the reins a bit and um, you know, be a bit more health minded, I guess. So I did a video earlier in the year, March 29th, why mass monster Jordan Peters suddenly quit bodybuilding. So he didn't quit like literally bodybuilding, but you know, he quitting trying to proceed with stacking more mass on his frame and you know, refining his physique to get on a stage and win a pro, pro card presumably. And he's kind of like taking a more uh, refined kind of a conservative approach to it now where he's going to be uh, um, pursuing more like athletic endeavors, you know, trying to downsize a bit whilst, you know, still doing somewhat of what he loves to do. So he's kind of turning into more of a hybrid health conscious bodybuilding model. So anyways, he is pretty transparent about his shit. He doesn't really hold back when he talks about what he does, his dosages, you know, health, um, concerns, anything of that nature. And he posted this, which is his blood work. Just got back my second lot of bloods in this low dose period. As I previously said, I've been on 250 milligrams of testosterone propionate per week, recently added 25 milligrams of proviron a day. And there has been fleeting use of quarter tabs of aromacin based on how I feel and trying to keep water down to an absolute minimum as my GI feels much better that way if I control estrogen a little. Again, as I previously said, when I was done with competing and pushing gear hard, there would be Primo runs, Primo Bowling, which I am defo happy to do based on this blood work. I will go into more on my log on my site, but nothing has changed. I have zero interest in competing, zero interest in getting heavier. I am enjoying being much lighter than my peak weight, but defo enjoying training and looking how I do. So over the coming months, I expect my peak strength to reclimb again. I will share my blood work at what I predict will be the midpoint of my Prima Bowling run. And then again, at the end of it, I can honestly say I feel the best I have in a very long time. And my blood work coincides with that. If you are taking bits, I strongly urge you to stay on top of your blood work. Um, is this another word for gear? Um, never heard that. Once you have built a chunk of muscle, it's surprising what you can do, taking much less to keep a fair percentage of it. I still think that to get big, big, you are going to have to push hard at some point. It's just not realistic to assume you can get there without pushing. But once you have built it, try to be as smart as you can and make decisions that will impact your long-term happiness as well as your short term. So anyways, this is a full breakdown of his blood work and I kind of wanted to go through it and um, you know, provide insight where needed or, you know, not just more so my analysis, you know, take from it what you will. Obviously this guy knows what the fuck he's doing, but I thought, you know, some things stood out to me that I thought it was worth touching on for shits and gigs. So anyways, full blood count, his hematology looks fine. You know, nothing wrong there that is standout. Um, and his metabolic parameters, his uh, creatine kinase is significantly elevated. But when you look at his EGFR, his creatinine, you know, the rest of the metabolic parameters, everything looks solid. So it makes you wonder why is this so severely elevated? Well, presumably it's from muscle damage induced by training. That's what I would assume. That's just speculation at the end of the day, but this guy trains harder than probably anybody you know. And he is, uh, induces, I can imagine like the maximum amount of damage you can fucking do to a body before killing yourself essentially. So creatine kinase being, you know, this high, I don't know how far after a training session his blood work was. Is it one day, two day, three day? I don't know. But this is what I would speculate is the cause of this given the 
you know, everything else looking pretty fucking flawless. When I say flawless, I don't mean like, I mean for the, the parameters given, the fact that this guy's on 250 tests, 25 proviron a day, a little bit of an aromatase inhibitor. So anyways, now we get into some of the more interesting stuff, the lipid parameters. So he has a, um, everything looks pretty solid, except his HDL expectedly is 0.9 millimoles per liter, which if you convert into like a US metric, I believe that's like 35, 36-ish in uh, milligrams per deciliter. So that's probably what a lot of you guys are familiar with. And in general, you would wanna see a 40 milligram per deciliter at bare minimum, ideally over a 50 to even be considered, you know, solid in that regard. However, how many guys who are on exogenous androgens do walk around at 50 plus? Not very many, especially when they're introducing things like proviron on top, especially when they're on super physiological amounts of androgens. It's just not very common. So, and especially coming off of a big blast and then, you know, not really cleaning out necessarily, staying on a pretty fucking reasonable amount. Now, obviously objectively to a bodybuilders is not very much, but for the lipids, like it's a decent amount for keeping you suppressed in terms of your HDL. So anyways, I'm sure he's on top of it in terms of what he could be doing to boost it, but just some things I wanted to mention off the bat. Proviron is going to hurt the HDL a bit. And is there really a point of Proviron being in there in, there in the first place? That's what we're gonna get into shortly. But just off the bat, know that Proviron will have a deleterious impact on your HDL above and beyond the super physiological dose of test. Um, things you could be doing to offset, you know, the drop in HDL or, you know, get it back up. Obviously avoiding aromatase inhibitors, keeping your estrogen where it should be physiologically relative to your testosterone. If you're at 250 a week and you are micro dosing essentially, presumably, cause he's using propionate. I imagine he's doing an every day or every other day administration schedule. Your burden of androgen exposure is not that significant where I would imagine aromatase inhibitors that necessary now again he mentioned how he feels better when he does it so you know by all means and his estradiol doesn't look you know like crazy you know fucked up but it's probably not necessarily in parallel with actual aromatase activity and is going to be somewhat suppressive of his hdl you know the longer he keeps that aromatase inhibitor in there the more he's hindering his hdl with the lack of like full capacity aromatization now above and beyond that what are some like things he could be introducing if he's not already? Citrus bergamot, obviously decently effective over-the-counter supplement for helping your HDL, having a high quality. Um, krill oil seems to have interesting data that may suggest it's superior to fish oil, but in general, just having a good omega-3 profile in your diet model and potentially krill oil on top. Um, other things, nicotinic acid specifically of niacin, not the you know no flush stuff, the nicotinic acid specifically is a pretty potent booster of HDL. Now, does that actually impact your likelihood of dying? Not really. When you look at the differences in uh, mortality between individuals who've taken you know, niacin for HDL versus individuals who've not, it seems to have no net impact at the end of the day on survival. If I recall correctly, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but if I recall correctly, the niacin is more of a it's almost like it just makes your blood work look prettier, but it doesn't really have a net impact on your health it seems, at least from the data I have seen. But in general, if you added that in, it would definitely boost the HDL up. Um, what else? Things as innocuous as azetamide might be useful for balancing the uh, lipid profile here. Now, in general, that is something that would be implemented for broad spectrum lipid modulation. But for him, he has a pretty solid fucking profile, as we can see here. Um, nothing is really, you know, significantly aberrant. Everything looks pretty spot on, except for the HDL, which is pretty fucking common honestly like guys on trt guys on you know like not that much shit but still using shit having like a just under the good spot hdl and then everything else being pretty on point even me pretty fucking common that is a blood test result this exact lipid profile i've seen a fucking million times dude so again could he get this into range just by you know some simple interventions um, yeah, he probably could. So anyways, getting into the hormones, endocrinology, we have expectedly follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone in the gutter. Um, this is going to be an occurrence of negative feedback through the HPTA. Obviously when you're using super physiological amounts of testosterone, you're going to have negative feedback through androgen receptor activation, estrogen receptor activation, which is going to signal to your hypothalamus to not be pulsing out gonadotropin-releasing hormone to your pituitary, which will then not 
produce any luteinizing hormone or follicle stimulating hormone going to your testes. So anyways, um, expectedly those are crushed, you know, no surprise there. Testosterone at 81.3 nanomoles per liter. Pretty fucking high. Free testosterone, 4.261 nanomoles per liter. Now the reason I like this, now everyone's probably like, what the fuck are nanomoles per liter? Well, I will show you the calculation first, then I'll explain why I sort of like this here. Okay, so the high end of the reference range is 29 animals per liter for total T, which shows a 836.42 nanogram per deciliter total being the high end of the reference range in, uh, I don't know, the UK. I'm not sure where it is exactly, but presumably somewhere around there, which is interesting because that's like Canada. The fucking total T reference range barely goes up to, you know, doesn't go that high. You know, it's pretty easy to uh, fall within normal given these kind of reference ranges. And if you are an elite, I don't know, testosterone producer, you could be classified essentially as super physiological pretty fucking easily. But anyways, 81.3, what are we looking at for that? 81.3, we're looking at 2,344.85 nanograms per deciliter. Yeah, on 250, not that fucking much gear. And it's a pretty high T. And this is on propionate too. So a lot of people don't realize when they go to a frequent dosing schedule, what their testosterone levels actually are. Reason being, they're using an anthate or cypionate and they're shooting it once a week or some shit, blasting your levels into the sky, and then waiting until the end of the week during a trough to test their blood, saying, oh, I have a, you know, an 1100, it's not that high. It's like, bro, You've missed this entire fucking bolus into your system at one time. The super physiological aromatization, the super physiological 5-alpha reduction in DHT, the sky high testosterone levels in cycle territory essentially for a very intermittent period of time. And then the fucking crash thereafter that you're testing your blood in, it's not indicative of what's going on. This guy is probably on at least an every other day administration schedule. And as you can see, when you actually get your blood drawn, when you have that frequent of a schedule, it's representative. Now, again, this is going to be different for every individual, but a lot of people don't realize how much 250 can actually be. 2,344, quite a fucking bit. Reason why I like nanomoles per liter is not because I like nanomoles per liter, as paradoxical as that sounds, I actually like nanograms per deciliter. It's because they gave him a free tea that is also in nanomoles per liter. So we can actually compare and contrast it with the exact same units, which most labs don't do. They'll give you a fucking picogram per milliliter or some shit, or they'll give you something that's not even directly comparable to your total tea. Because ideally, when you want to see if you have a disproportionately high amount of free tea, and if you're kind of like healthy through proper regulation of binding proteins, you would look for about a 2 to 3% free tea relative to your total. And you can't really do that. We don't have the same fucking unit of measurement. But here we have nanomoles per liter. So we have 4.261 nanomoles per liter divided by 81.3. What do we get? We get 0 0.052. So this is, he has 5.2% of his total T is unbound as free. Pretty fucking high. Pretty highly androgenic environment that... Uh, is not necessarily indicative of, you know, the most healthy ratio. Now, this is where it gets into the proviron discussion. He mentions how he added in 25 milligrams of proviron per day. Is this for inhibiting estrogen-induced RNA transcription at the receptor site for anti-estrogenic activity? Is it presumably, I'm assuming he's using it more for, if it's not for cosmetic reasons or for acute performance outcomes in a neurological force production aspect, I imagine it's for most people use proviron thinking it's going to bind up shbg and free up more tests into circulation to make my test better essentially now when you have a 13.1 nanomole per liter shbg is that actually a useful practice or is it potentially just harming you more that's what we're going to get into so this is the reference range of shbg which is 18.3 to 54.1 and with him he has the 13.1 nanomole per liter shbg which is low so he mentioned he recently added in 25 proviron per day, which is going to, like it binds with such a high affinity to SHBG, it's going to free up a lot of tests into circulation. Because again, test has, you know, a much lower binding affinity. And as a consequence of, you know, really occupying the majority of the almost lo complete lack of SHBG to begin with, you can imagine how much is being saturated with proviron relative to the T when you already have such a lackluster amount of binding protein. So again, 
not only are you driving down the SHBG and the HDL a little bit unnecessarily with the Proviron, but you're binding it up and occupying it when you otherwise would probably benefit from this regulating mechanism in your body, given that SHBG seems to potentially have androgen delivering properties too. There are um, binding protein complexes that actually deliver hormones to target tissues as well, above and beyond simply having a geyser of hormones freely circulating in your body. So having a proper amount of SHBG, or like at least in the bottom barrel of the reference range, is probably ideal in the context of testosterone. When you have a 13.1, there's an argument for the fact that you may even hyper-excrete this shit. This may be actually counterproductive and also put you in an environment of hyperandrogen dominance well, that would otherwise be less healthy for your brain, probably for your heart, probably maybe even less conducive to muscle growth potentially. That's all you know, kind of speculative though, given on the uh, lack of real information surrounding binding protein complexes. But again, at the end of the day, this is low and the proviron is not really helping. Like we don't even have enough SHBG to regulate the test that's in its system as is. And then we're introducing something else to smash it even down more and free up even more tests into circulation. To me, it makes no sense personally. Now, again, that is in the context of binding to SHBG though, it has nothing to do with, is he trying to inhibit estrogenic activity at the receptor site? Is he trying to get a bit drier because he likes the look of it? Does he like the neurological impact of proviron? Does it make his fucking dick harder? Like, I don't know, what is he using this for? So again, that is just my interpretation of what I would imagine he's probably using it for. And I think it's counterproductive. So anyways, progesterone being high, kind of interesting given the down regulation of the HPTA. And this is in general something that some people actually supplement on top of TRT in order to kind of backfill neurosteroid cascades, especially for individuals who are on finasteride. Now, I'm saying don't use fucking progesterone exogenously if you're on finasteride and you're natural because that will actually suppress your HPTA. But if you're on TRT, this is actually something that some individuals are using on top of their TRT for certain neurological benefits and whatnot. Now, again, I don't really know why this is high. Kind of fucking interesting to me. Um, I would be interesting to see a high sensitivity test because for all we know, this is a cross detection. I, like, I don't fucking know. I would, I'm just speculating off the top of my head. I don't know what else he's using, but he has a bit of aromacin sometimes. He has 25 milligrams of mesterolone and then he has 250 milligrams of test probe. I'm not really sure why the progesterone would be high, to be honest. Kind of interesting though. Now, interesting as well is his thyroid function. He has a low TSH as well as a low T4. So this kind of indicates to me, are you on exogenous T3? Because why else would you have negative feedback preventing you from producing the stimulating hormone that would otherwise tell your body to produce T4, which subsequent to that would convert into T3? Well, the only reason you have a concurrently suppressed TSH and T4 is in general, if you're on so much T3 that your body has absolutely no need whatsoever to produce T4, which then, you know, makes enough T3. So for me, you know, I'm wondering, are you on a certain dose of T3 like year round or did you add that in? You're not talking about it. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. Like maybe he needs thyroid replacement and it's just, you know, something I don't know about because I don't follow his stuff, you know, religiously or anything, but I just, you know, it's a standout thing that I noticed. And if he's not on T3, like this is really fucking weird and kind of concerning to be honest. So I hope he's on T3 or maybe I'm just missing something that is otherwise going to explain this. The only time I've ever seen a blood test result like this is when I was on like fucking Cytomel. Immunology, um, this is basically an additional component of a more comprehensive thyroid panel to see if there's any kind of autoimmune issues. TPO antibodies, thyroglobulin antibodies, everything looks to be below the detectable ranges. Um, so good, good. Vitamin D, solid. Vitamin B12, solid. Serum folate. Yeah, so anyways, that's kind of... Uh, how it breaks down, dude. You know, I think the whole first page is pretty fucking good. The CK obviously, you know, assessed with longitudinal data. And again, this is not like necessarily telling him what he should be doing or shouldn't be doing. This is just like, you know, people tag me and shit and ask for my opinion. And if it makes an interesting video and helps you kind of gather information that can then be applicable in your own life to bring to your physician and your doctor, your endocrinologist, whatever it is, and then get a more informed perspective about your health status and the shit you're using, fucking great. You know, but anyways, this is guy is a big name and obviously a great opportunity to talk about this stuff. And who knows, maybe he'll, I'll say something that he might have not thought of. You never fucking know. So anyways, the HDL, I mentioned what I would be doing. 
you know, not using the aromatase inhibitor, probably be looking at things like citrus bergamot, potentially nicotinic acid, potentially krill oil at a decent dose, getting rid of the misterolone, um, provirin, um, I forget what else I said. Maybe looking at azetamide introduction. Other than that, like that in itself would push him into normal. All that shit would definitely do that if he's not already doing it. Again, going down to the testosterone, the free testosterone, again, you know, I mentioned the disproportionately high free as a consequence of the low SHBG. Um, the proviron, not really, uh, I would pull out the proviron personally. Um, progesterone, kind of odd. I would definitely keep an eye on that for longitudinal data. And then the thyroid panel looks like T3 supplementation to me, but you know, could be wrong on that. So anyways, main takeaway, I don't see, uh, the use of this, you know, some of the natural supplemental introductions as far as the HDL. Um, and then the thyroid and the progesterone, definitely something to keep an eye on unless this is an expected outcome of, of, as, as a result of thyroid use. But anyway, it's like, ultimately like this is pretty, you know, hematology is good. There's no, you know, excessive issues that you would expect from some guys can't even fucking use barely above TRT without getting like a significantly elevated RBC nearly out of range to the point where they're concerned if they should do a therapeutic phlebotomy. And then consequent to that, they have to worry about, am I going to drive my ferritin in the ground? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? He does not seem to have to worry about that, despite the fact that he's on a reasonable dose. You know, his whole fucking hematology panel looks solid as hell. Everything else looks pretty fucking solid. Um, actually, one thing that actually did just stand out to me is the uh, C-reactive protein. So this is a marker of inflammation and is something that, you know, people should definitely be keeping an eye on. This is, in fact, in the same unit of measurement that we use in the States. And I noticed how the reference range goes a lot higher. You know, the one I'm familiar with goes up to three. This one goes up to five. And in general, like, I don't think three is acceptable either, to be honest. Like, 2.1 is uh, concerning. Like, I would want to see that at 0 0.3 or lower to be like, holy, like, this is not a concern fucking at all. So anyways inflammatory markers a little bit just like you know keep a fucking eye on it is what i would be doing but again for all this shit i don't know what his diet model is like you know he's a uh um huge fucking bodybuilder who obviously has you know more stress on his system than the average joe um who is natural so like all in all this is not bad and like kudos to him for being so transparent about his stuff and uh really you know keeping us in the loop and you know educating us as things go so we can see how he responds and then you know we can take that and use that context for applying to our own lives and whatnot to be more safe so anyways kudos to uh jp for always being a fucking uh beacon of information to the community um one of the most transparent bodybuilders in the industry one of the most uh you know highly uh reputable reputable and credible sources of information um definitely check out his stuff um, I, don't, I don't know if he posts on YouTube, but he's pretty active on Instagram and he posts cool stuff like this quite often. So uh, check him out, give him a follow. So anyway, hopefully you guys enjoy that. Thank you guys for watching. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. All the comments help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Like, subscribe. Check out my blog, moreplacemoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplacemoredates. Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you wanna support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with. In the video description below, my TRT clinic, it's all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home, get high quality oversight from doctors who understand how to interpret um, biomarkers like this and whatnot, how to even order the right lab work based on your individual needs, get high quality diagnostics, and then design an individualized protocol for you based on your own imbalances and deficiencies and or, you know, lifestyle go goals accordingly, if you are, even if you're natural, like we're not just a cookie cutter testosterone mill. We pride ourselves in our services and high quality oversight and medical interpretation of anything that could be useful for optimization, not just from a hormonal context, but from all aspects of health and uh, optimization. But anyways, so you can check that out if you're interested, my recommended panels, my recommended diagnostics, as well as Gorilla Mind, Nootropic Formulas, Gorilla Mode, pre-workout formulas, I designed myself from scratch, recommended diet model for gaining muscle and sports performance, whilst being mindful of micronutrient intake, sleep hygiene, gut health, etc., and anything else I'm associated with, it is all in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.